Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our next edition of Maestro's Musings. My name is Geraldine Parent, Executive Director, and it's always a delight um, to host these conversations with our music director, Rosemary Thompson, and we have a wonderful conversation ahead for us today. Before we get started, just want to say you can ask any questions in the chat room. Uh, we're getting a little bit more used to this. So if a dying, you know, a really interested question, please put it in the chat room. We'll try and um, answer it before too long. But in my experience, Rosemary seems to cover off any of the potential questions that the audience might have. So we're usually covered. Uh, this session will probably run for about 30 minutes uh, today. We welcome everybody who's joined us uh, today and it will be available uh, for reviewing on our website within the next couple of days. And with that, I'm going to hand uh, the mic, so to speak, over to Rosemary Thompson um, to introduce our guest today. Thank you so much, Geraldine, and welcome, everybody. It's This is really fun for me to do our uh, Master Musing series this, this year on all of the composers, um, Canadian composers that we will be performing, because it's it just makes everything so visceral and we're so used to performing music by, you know, dead white Europeans and, and to have this interaction with living composers is one of the most exciting things um, that performers can do these days. So our guest today is the wonderful Jennifer Butler. Jennifer um, did her undergraduate bachelor's degree in music and composition at Wilfrid Laurier University in Waterloo, Ontario. And then she uh, followed up with her master's degree and her doctor, doctorate in musical arts at UBC. Um, in Vancouver. Jennifer has received commissions across the country and her music has been commissioned, performed and broadcast also in the United States, Australia and Europe. Um, she is a very active supporter of new music of other composers as well through her associations um, and service, volunteer service. She was president of the council for the Canadian League of Composers. She sits on the boards of Vancouver's Redshift, which is a wonderful um, recording um, company that records Canadian composers' works, also the Standing Wave Ensemble in Vancouver. She's on the Canadian New Music Network, and she is currently the chair of the Advisory Council for the Canadian Music Centre BC region, which I also sit on that council, so we have lovely interactions. Um, we're really thrilled that Jennifer also acts as our composer um, teacher for our own Okanagan Symphony Youth Orchestra students. Jennifer's music is it's been described as um, she uses sort of sounds and juxtaposes sounds of quiet that are quiet and fragile, but also with loud, forceful outbursts, silence, organic change, layered textures, holding and releasing tension are qualities that she looks at in many of her compositions. But I love how evocative her titles are. So the stars have closed their eyes. Songs for Claywick. Stolen materials, stolen time. The tide rises, the tide falls. Oh, beautiful, beautiful evocative titles. And the piece that we're playing uh, this weekend, uh, next weekend, I guess, uh, it'll be this weekend by the time some of you are listening to it, is uh, And Birds Do Sing, which is a beautiful work that we're going to talk about today. But I wanted to lead in with the fact that Jennifer's probably biggest mentor um, as a composer in Canada and one of her biggest artistic influences was the late Armory Schaefer. And uh, that's another thing that we share because I, I had the great fortune of working with Murray on a couple of his pieces. Um, and he was actually in town with in residence with us for a week, 10 years ago when we first performed Falcon's Trumpet and recorded it. So he was here for that recording session. And um, on the same program that we're playing Jennifer's and Birds Do Sing, we are also playing Falcon's Trumpet, um, which is on our Canadian Soundscapes CD. So there's this lovely tie-in that was completely serendipitous. I didn't realize that Jennifer had such a connection with Murray. So Jennifer, I would love to ask you to start off by telling us about your interaction with Murray, especially as part of his Wolf Project. And welcome, Jennifer Butler. <laughs> well, thank you so much. It's such a thrill to be here. And uh, I love I love these opportunities to talk about my music with, you know, especially with great musicians and and uh, in, in anticipation of this exciting concert. So, yeah, I mean, I was uh, an undergraduate composer and I was in my third year at Wilfrid Laurier. And one of my professors, Peter Hatch, started a brand new music festival called the Open Ears Festival, which still continues today. Yes, it's a wonderful that festival. First year, 
um, Roy Schaefer was the keynote speaker. And I remember he got up and I was sort of in awe because of course I knew his music, but I had never met him. And he talked almost entirely about this wolf project. And I thought, what is this? And as it turned out, a number of other um, people at this festival were also like Ellen Waterman, who's a great flute player and Claude Schreier, who's a composer and Gail Young, um, another wonderful composer from Ontario were also members of this wolf project. And so there was just a lot of talking about it. And I thought, this sounds really amazing. Um, it's, it was my, my early glimpses of it were that it's a wilderness project and growing up in Victoria, BC, I spent a lot of time in nature and nature is a huge part of the influence of my music. Um, and then also, of course, being a music project, I just thought, well, I've never heard of anything like this. Um, so I spent a couple of years trying to figure out more and getting to know some people involved and how could I get involved. And uh, in the meantime, I actually moved back to the West Coast. So I came back to do my master's here and uh, I had written some letters to to Gail Young and and uh, she connected me with a couple who live in Victoria um, and they became my mentors because at that time to become a member, the project was was sort of thriving it's this huge interactive interdisciplinary musical theater project that happens in the wilderness in northern ontario and um at that time to become a member you had to find people who were already members talk to them write a letter apply and and uh so i went through all of that and um, i learned a lot more about the project the project happens in this um wilderness preserve called the Halliburton Forest. And it's a privately owned land, a huge, huge uh, forest that has been sustainably forested for more than a century now by a uh -huh. German family. And um, they are big fans of Murray's music. So they have given him, they, a, a few of his productions have happened there as well. I think the Palace of the Cinnabar Phoenix when it was produced was done at right. Halliburton Forest. And then the Wolf Project has been there for, um, well, more than two decades for sure. About I, I'm not sure when it was when it first went there, um, and so we're really the only ones who use that land. And then a few people who have hunting privileges, or you know, it's a really wilderness spot. So you have to drive quite far north um, to Halliburton, and then there's a base camp, and you register, and then from there it's still a long drive on logging roads. Then you unload everything and you have to canoe for another hour to the spot. Um, oh, I so didn't realize that. Wow. Very remote. And, you know, you're canoeing double bases and drum kits and <laughs> instruments. And it's quite a sight and all the costumes and everything like that. Um, the the wow. project was designed by Murray to be for eight days in the woods. And it's supposed to be eight groups of eight people. Eight is apparently his favorite number. And it kind of resonates all throughout the project in different ways. Um, there were four different sites used very far apart. So the site that I was at for most of my time in the project um, was on a lake called Crow Lake. And it was about an hour hike to the next closest campsite through wow. the woods. And so the, the four sites were very spread apart. and. Um, and so it really you do bond very much with your group and your uh, and there were 16 people at each site and in in the early years, the project was full and. Um, and very vibrant full of musicians about 50% musicians, but then also their partners, there were theater people dancers visual artists um, and then and then lots of people who weren't professional artists, but who were brought in because they were someone's spouse or someone's. Right. Um, family member or friend. Um, and that is one of the things that made the project so special because it, it, it was sort of this art focused way of living, but for this amazing community of diverse people. And so the, the Wolf Project is actually part of a much bigger project that Murray started in the sixties called Patria. Yeah. And the Princess of the Stars is the prologue to Patria. It's the, it's probably the piece that's best known and it begins this story about a wolf and a princess and then there's like 10 operas <laughs> that happen <laughs> and when i say opera i mean some of them are more traditionally staged operas but some of them like take place in a labyrinth so murray built this huge labyrinth on his property and it's a solo journey into this labyrinth and then you meet characters on your way um you know he did raw in the in the yeah. uh, union station in toronto at midnight and i think it was also done at the science world here and uh -huh. Spirit Garden, which is like, 
you plant a garden in the spring and that's the first half and then you harvest the garden in the fall. That's, that's the piece that I did with Murray. I did the spirit garden in, in Winnipeg in, at the St. Norbert Arts and Cultural Center, um, it, both in the spring and in the fall. So he was there for a month and that was where I got to really spend some time with him now. Yeah. Oh, really like out of the box, completely out of the opera, out of the box, right? And so the Wolf Project is actually, actually the epilogue to the story. So it's where oh, the okay. story comes together. So in the beginning, the wolf and the princess, um, they, the, well, the, the princess actually falls from the sky. She's the princess of the stars. She falls from the sky because she sees that the wolf is in pain. And basically what's happened is like, there's the humans are wrecking the world. The animal council comes together. How do we solve this problem? And bear stands up and he's like, we need to work with the humans. And wolf is like, no, we need to like attack them. And then, uh, you know, the, I think the animals go against the wolf's decision and he, he kind of goes off in anger and the princess comes down and the, the princess's father says, you have to travel the world until you, you know, heal wolf's pain. Right. And so then for 10 operas, they, they happen like, like you're raw is like in Egypt right. and you know, they, 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 these characters appear, but they never meet. So then in the wolf project, the premise is that humans are invited into the forest and by mm -hmm. the animals. And we have to perform a ritual that will bring back wolf and will bring wolf and princess together. And, and so it takes eight days to prepare this, this ritual. Um, in, so when we come into the forest, we come as humans and we, we uh, spend the first sort of half of the week in our small groups preparing um, little theater pieces, basically is the best way to describe them. They're called encounters. And each group is assigned a different part of the Patria story to kind of tell, and that kind of catches everyone up. And every year they're different and they're incredibly creative and it depends sort of who's there and what their talents are. Um, so sometimes, you know, you get to flex a lot of muscles. You get to act and you get to write and you get to be a musician. You maybe have to dance. I one year I had to wear a mask and, and there was a director there who was very strict about how to how to wear masks and we had the, all, we, he's like I'm compressing three years of mask workshops into one afternoon and he was you know and and um so you know you learn a lot of skills and you get to try a lot of things that you would normally not get to and you, we then the next few days we spend traveling around and watching all these shows and performing them and they're long days because you you perform your hour-long show and then you watch another one and you hike for an hour and then you watch another one you know so they're it's it's yeah cool you come home and you have to like cook dinner on a fire and yeah it's quite it's right. quite demanding because it's wilderness camping there's nothing there when we arrive we have to dig our own pits and we have to you know right. we're all in tents and, and we have to bring everything in and hang our tarps by and, canoes by canoe yeah wow. it's, all, it's all brought in by canoe so uh yes yeah, so you have to pack smartly uh, <laughs> i was a, i was a flute player so i didn't you know i had the advantage of like a little instrument that i could easily <laughs> transport um, and let's see. So, yeah. So, so over the years, I mean, I, I attended the project 12 times over, over 16 years, the last few years when, after I had my kids, I started going every second year and then it just, it just, the pilgrimage into the woods became a little too much for us. But, uh, so the last time that I attended was in 2016, um, which was, an amazing time and that was also the last time that i saw murray and he wasn't attending he was quite ill at that point yeah. so coming into the project but he still wouldn't greet everyone at the base camp wow. it was really for murray it was really um i think a very special like family for him yeah it was really clear that when he was there um it meant a lot to him the project i think he often talked about it as one of his most important his most important creations wow um, and it was it was a very collaborative piece um the you know he kind of wrote an original plan the score the ideas but it all came from a lot of conversations and collaborative work in those yeah. early days and then over the years people have contributed different pieces to it so different poets have contributed different composers have contributed so now it's like this wonderful organic ever-changing piece that's it's truly like for me it's just like the quintessential canadian work and also right. it, um it's it's just incredible that it that it has sustained i mean it's been 
definitely over 30 years. I think it's been more than 35 years now that it's been running every single year. And um, a lot of people were involved from for a lot of years, but even when they kind of their lives change and like new people come and um, you know, in the last five years, I haven't been attending, but I've, I'm still part of the community and part of the conversation. And there's been a huge change in, in our awareness of how to treat indigenous content. And because, because of the nature of the project, um, people over the years had brought things, had brought songs and rituals from different indigenous cultures. Uh, but now with this new awareness, there's sort of this um, idea of like, if we can't really trace the lineage and we can't for sure yeah. know that something was given as a gift to the project to use in a certain way, that's all been taken out now. And some of the, some of even Murray's music has been rewritten and taken out because the, there was a concern that it just wasn't written um, with this new kind of yeah. and, and knowledge. And so there's been a big shift there. Also a really big shift in terms of how gender is treated in the project. So like the roles that were for, for a long time, one gender or another are now really fluid. Um, and there's a, a big, you know, big, lots of conversations happening around that. Like, does, does this person need to be a gender? Can, what, what happens if it's a different gender or what happens if they're neutral? So there's been a lot of those kinds of changes that have happened too, which is kind of exciting that- it's Nice to see it evolve, yeah this piece has that in it and I think because it's so collaborative and it's always been that way it allows for that change right. and then yet still the sort of essential element of what it is is there so it's it's pretty remarkable I think it's incredibly unique a bit, like a hugely unique community what it what a I, I remember hearing about the wolf project from Murray in like 1998 I think was when I first uh, met him in person and and I kept thinking oh I want to be a wolf I never got it together to actually uh, participate so just what an amazing experience for you so I know that um, it's interesting you said the quintessentially Canadian experience because I've always when I've listened to the Falcon's trumpet I've always thought it was the quintessential Canadian piece and I know that it was written from ideas um, where you hear music coming from across the lake right because you would hear hear the music as you would birds without actually seeing it. Can you tell us a little bit about how um, the Wolf Project and your experience in it sort of translated into your work and Birds Do Sing, which was commissioned by Victoria Symphony? Yeah, it was commissioned right? by Tanya yeah. Miller and the, and the Victoria Symphony. And um, absolutely, yeah. I mean, of course, being at the project and being in the presence of someone like Murray Schaefer, who's so attentive to listening in such a way. I mean, I think that was the biggest influence on me. And just being in an, in an environment like that, where you are hearing things differently. So, and sometimes like those little encounters I was talking about were incredible listening experiences. So I remember one where we were hiking to a location, but they're called encounters because we never quite know when it's going to start. And suddenly we hear the sound of a double bass coming through the forest. But because you're in the forest, you don't, you don't have a sense of the direction in the same way that you do uh -huh. in an inside space. And so it's just the most magical, beautiful thing. So it was little experiences like that that have really informed me as a composer. But with this, uh, and Birds Do Sing in particular, um, I mean, Murray took a lot of the music he wrote for the Wolf Project, a lot of the chants and songs that he wrote for the Wolf Project, and he's woven them into some of his orchestral piece, pieces and, and other chamber music. And um, this, uh, there's a big melody in the, in this And Birds Do Sing. It, it, it ends up in this loud eight part canon, which you can't miss at all. And um, that melody, I was actually asked by the project to write um, as part of the final ritual that, and it's the moment where wolf and princess are united so they finally come together and they touch and there's a moment of silence for it's the first time that they touch after you know 13 operas or and uh <laughs> 12 operas i guess and, that's a and, long build up <laughs> and murray had written this song for that moment that no one really loved and it was called <laughs> the circle has made them whole and it sounded a little musically it was like the circle has made them whole the circle has made them whole <laughs> and everyone it was like this really serious powerful moment and and then it was this kind of goofy song that made everyone laugh and so um so then the project it was must have been in about 2009 asked me to write um a new piece 
And I wasn't for that, the, for that moment, that moment. And right. I was, you know, that was obviously a really big honor. And I collaborated with one of the poets in the project. And he, I think he was like, I don't know what to, how do I, how do we do this moment? Like, right. it's too big. So he came back with like three words <laughs> and um, it was Metwa Kirkos, which is meadow circle in this meta European language that's been created, which kind of takes aspects of all the languages and brings them oh. together. Okay. And he thought that was appropriate for the project and uh, Metwa Kirko, so that's Meadow Circle and then Sterla Reos, which is like Star King or Star, like it's kind of, Reos is like a word that might encompass like princess and then Wulkwos, which is wolf. Yeah. So that's what he gave me to work with. And um, so the melody that you hear, actually you hear the entire, you hear the whole song in the orchestra piece. So the melody is all set to the words Metwa Kirkos. It's a four part vocal piece, which we sing at the project at this moment. And then there's that ostinato underneath. Yeah. And that's the vocalist part is like the da 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 You'll hear that. And then there's a ostinato part, which is the Sterla Reos part, which is like doo -doo 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 -doo. That's so cool. I didn't realize that they came from text, those moments. Yeah, which I didn't, Very cool. I, didn't know, I didn't put that in my program notes. Yeah, yeah well, I, I think I think it's so helpful to have the whole backstory, right? To understand where the text came from. I can see how in program notes it would be a bit diluted, but that's a, a beautiful. But it also, I was pregnant at the time when I wrote it, and it, it evolved also into a kind of a lullaby that I would sing to my kids. And I would sing when I was, it was my first child. So I was pregnant and I would sing this song and I was writing it. So it became this very important piece of music in my life. And so then I was commissioned to write this piece also when I was pregnant. So it just felt natural to weave it in to this orchestral piece too. I love that. And, and the title, And Birds Do Sing. All right, okay. so. When I was commissioned to write this piece, yeah, I was pregnant and I was really feeling the weight of bringing a child into this world that has so much uh, just the challenge. <laughs> and, and I was actually going to write a very bleak piece um, about the disappearance of birdsong and the, the effects of climate change on, you know, and the extinction and stuff. And, and then I became a mother. And there just wasn't a place for me anymore to have that kind of despair. Like I had to, I had to jump into hope. And mm -hmm. so um, it, it kind of evolved from Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, which is about how pesticides uh, and chemicals, have, especially DDT, um, have affected songbirds. So that was my original mm -hmm. idea. But then after becoming a mother, I completely switched gears and I wanted to write a hopeful piece. So that's where the title comes from, and it's "And Birds Do Sing," which is actually a mm -hmm. Shakespeare from a, a quotation from Shakespeare. So, um, you know, it's sort of like I think it's from *Midsummer Night's Dream*, and it's like with a hey and a ho and a hey nonny no, and there's like, and then it kind of continues on. But there's this line: <laughs> "And birds do sing." And birds do so sing, it's, yeah. So it's sort of like this, yeah. It's a, it's a, it's, it's meant to just sort of cling to hope that hey, birds are still singing, and we still have that hope which I really needed at that time in my life to, to, to jump into that instead of delving into the, the despair, which was much easier before I was a parent to sort of. <laughs> right. I know that feeling. I just love the, the, there's so much, um, there's so much texture in the story behind your piece that, that just enriches the whole experience. I mean, the piece stands on its own. It's absolutely beautiful. I can't wait to perform it and not just have it in my head right now, starting from the score. Um, and I know our audience is gonna love it, but, but understanding, you know, your journey right. to get to the piece and the fact, and, and all the timing and the, um, you know, the fact that you were part of that project and, and then asked to write that piece and then commissioned to write the orchestral piece and and your personal journey of of becoming a mother and all of that it just like everything sort of has to line up and i and then i so it just enriches the experience for me hearing all this story from you that we're playing it on a concert that features a murray schaefer piece as well it's just yeah. like it was meant to be because when i programmed it i had no idea that you had participated in the wolf project so i just i love oh, the program. circle 
I was just like, what? This is so, yeah, this is so crazy. And and, uh, we planned it. We'll just pretend we planned it. No, actually, I love, I love the idea that it was serendipitous and sort of, you know, I'm sure Murray is smiling somewhere in that, uh, what, what a giant of a man he was in this country um, and clearly in your life and in mine too. Um, we're so thrilled uh, to have you and, and Jennifer's going to be here with us, uh, I think for the first two shows, we're in Kelowna and Penticton traveling up with her kids. And so it's just such a special presence to have a living composer in the room, you know, when I can say, Oh, I'm not sure about that balance there. And normally I'm having to make those decisions and I can just say, what were you thinking? <laughs> or how does it work for you? It's a really lovely collaborative opportunity. And and I just want to um, touch a little bit on your work with our Okanagan Symphony Youth Orchestra students, because when the orchestra, the youth orchestra was founded by Imad Ramanj, another extraordinary composer in Canada, also featured on our CD, uh, Canadian Soundscapes, but he founded the youth orchestra 36 years ago and always made composing part of the part of the deal. And I'm not sure that there are any other youth orchestras that have that, certainly not that long standing a, a composition program. So we were thrilled last year when Jennifer took over as our composing instructor. One of the benefits of learning all of us how to be on Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer teaches at UBC in Vancouver and uh, she's able to do these Zoom calls with our students. And, um, and then we do a reading with the OSO for the students' composition. So just tell us, maybe give us a, a minute or two about your experience in the program, what do you think about teaching and, and these young composers? I just, I mean, I, I love teaching comp composition. Like it's, it's really magical. I didn't study composition at all until I got to university and it, I, I grew up in Victoria and I studied flute and I was in the youth orchestra there and yeah, there was no composition program. Um, but I, as sort of in my later years of high school, I began to be really pulled towards contemporary music. So it was always kind of there for me. I feel there's people that when they encounter like new music for the first time, they either come alive or they like <laughs> shut down. And, and there's a small group of people that like really come alive. And and yeah. it, and so then when I went to university and I, I sort of took my first composition class, which was not really on purpose. It was kind of by accident, which is another long story, but, um, it turned out to be a, another serendipitous event that that then I, I felt the pull more and more. So now that I'm in a position where I get to work with young people and develop this creative side, it feels it's it's just one of my favorite things to do. I love I teach the first year composition class at UBC, which is often people's first real chance to compose and then working with the students in the Okanagan as well. It's um, it's really magical because these are such talented musicians. Like they have often been studying music since they were young. And, and the way that most of us learn music is that we don't think of it as a creative thing, um, which is different than the other arts. You know, when kids first right. encounter visual art, it's usually because someone puts a paintbrush in their hand yeah. and they say, go, you know? Um, the first time they, they encounter theater it's usually through theater games and imagination and improv and and dance as a young child it's like put some music on and let's have fun and music for young children has that element but it's usually recreating already written songs yeah usually, it's more about performance than about creation yeah it's and rarely is improvisation even part of it and it certainly wasn't for me uh, or creation or composing. And it's not till later that we get these opportunities. So for these students to have this in high school and then also to have that end, um, you know, experience of having an orchestra play their music. I mean, it, it, it must be just totally overwhelming for them. Like it must be in a good way. Like it, it must be just so powerful. Um, and oh, I just, yeah, I found this to be a really highly talented group of musicians. They were so engaged. They worked so hard. I mean. The amount of work it takes to write an orchestra piece, let alone create the score and all the parts, and then the courage it takes to put it out there. Yes. It's, it's huge. Um, and, you know, it was very short time frame also that they had to do it in. So it was such a joy to hear those pieces and to hear I, how much. When they I, when I got the scores last year, I, I was, I was looking through them going, oh my God. <laughs> there, there was so much there's just so much sophistication and imagination and uniqueness in them 
every, every one of them was so different. I was just blown away. As a teacher, that's what I focus on. Yeah. And I start from find something that's important to you, find the story you want to tell, find the thing that that means something to you, and then let's go from there. You know, so I yeah. always start my sessions with like, let's do a big brainstorm, let's make a mind map or let's draw a painting. Like some 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 of the students are amazing artists and they created, you know, artwork and then that was their thing that they were inspired by. And other people yeah. are more word focused or other people are more sound focused, whatever it is, it doesn't matter what's inspiring you, but start there. Yeah. And I think that really hit home with with those students in particular, so that it's true, like each of them had a piece that meant something to them and that was about who they are as a creative person um and yeah i find you know that's the point that's the whole point <laughs> what we do. Right? you know i just recreate something that someone else has done well jennifer we we're absolutely thrilled to have you working with our students they're so lucky i know every one of them just found it such a special experience and and many of them are coming back for their for their second year with you um but it's very clear to me in hearing your whole story about the creation of Anne Birds Do Sing, that you are living what you teach and that um, authenticity and that integrity makes you so brilliant at what you do, both as a composer and as a teacher. And I'm just so excited to have you here next week and to be performing your piece. It's it's really thrilling for me. And I know our audiences will love meeting you and hearing your work as well. And thank you for, for being with us today and for sharing that with you. The, the Wolf Project story and everything that's come out of it, it's just been transformative in this country, I think, in, in as far as music says. And you know, Evelyn Glenny, the great percussionist, you know what she said? She says, if you want young people to come to the symphony, play new music. Totally, right? I agree with, you know, and especially so many young composers now, there aren't hard lines of genre anymore. Yeah. Music is music and it's good music or, you know, it appeals to them and they're listening to everything and everything is available to them. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that, you can only hear those old pieces in the canon so many times before you want a new perspective. And sometimes placing an older piece with a new piece gives you that perspective. Absolutely. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mixing wanna, it up is fun. I think your programming this year is so inspired. I mean, I know that the composition community is just like looking to the Okanagan Symphony and saying, this is what we wish all orchestras were doing. And oh, thank you. It's, it's really exciting. And yeah, it's def we're, we're definitely noticing it. And, <laughs> We're so <laughs> to have to have a Canadian orchestra that you know really values Canadian music so it's great I appreciate that and I do very very much and I always have but and and I think um for both of us and for so many of our generation and and over the course of you know decades Murray really was the torchbearer you know he really was so I'm really thrilled about that connection on the program can't wait Jennifer so excited to have you here and so excited to play on birds do sing and thank you for joining me today Thanks everyone for listening. Come to the show. You will just be blown away.